wake up. It's time to learn about sleep. <laughs> cool. Yeah, lecture 6.6. Um, getting into that part of the chapter where it's called uh, um, alternate states, altered states of consciousness. Yeah, that's it. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more generally, but mostly this lecture is going to be about sleep um and and sleep is is fascinating and it's, it's a fascinating story to tell for a number of reasons um you kind of get the sense of as we go through this how much psychology the science of psychology depends on tools um you know and every science does right biology and chemistry have microscopes and etc uh you'll see that we have our sets of toys as well and as these toys develop we can suddenly study things that we couldn't really study before and we can understand them in different ways so you're going to get a sense of that story let's jump in from here so if we if we go back to this altered states thing now remember when i said consciousness has all these definitions and i tried to clear clarify that for you and i think you know the framework that i gave you did a really good job up until now <laughs> in a sense you know we were able to relate a lot of things about attention and whatnot to that diagram and how how everything kind of comes together um Every consciousness chapter then has this section, altered states of consciousness. And the funny thing is we're now going back to almost a more medical sort of definition where consciousness is, you know, they would think you're awake or you, and that therefore you're conscious or you're, you know, asleep or, or in a coma and then they would call you unconscious. So the idea is that we can be in different states and that maybe those two states, you know, normal sleep, let's say, well, I mean, we even consider sleep an altered state of consciousness. So this is, this, it gets really tricky. But, you know, the consciousness we know, our subjective experience, um, well, there are situations where it seems like that consciousness has been changed, that's been altered in some way. And so uh, let's, let's jump over hypnosis for a second and just say sleep. So, you know, when we're asleep, are we totally unconscious or is this a state of consciousness? And we're going to talk about sleep, but we'll especially talk about dreams because with dreams, it does feel more like a state of consciousness, right? You, you are sort of a, 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 yeah, what are you? <laughs> this is where it gets tricky, right? You are alert. You feel like you're experiencing things. You feel like you're interacting with a world, but it's a world created inside your head. So it's a different kind of subjective experience. And if, if that's what consciousness is about, our subjective experience, then yeah, it's an altered state. And this is the one we're really going to talk a lot about today. Also, of course, if I jump over this for a second to drugs, you know, we know by now that our machinery is a biochemical machinery, right? And, and everything in our body works by releasing neurotransmitters and hormones. Um, and that's why drugs impact us because drugs affect those same parts of our body that are already sensitive to chemicals. Um, you know, the, the natural neurotransmitters and the natural hormones. In fact, every drug that has an effect on us does so by in some way um, messing with the normal biochemical processes that are happening. And one of the potential results of some of these drugs is an actual altering of our state of consciousness. It feels like we are experiencing the world differently. <clears throat> In fact, if we go extreme to things like psychedelics, you know, it feels sometimes like we're experiencing the universe and life differently. Uh, and so that's what they would mean by an altered state of consciousness brought on by drugs. It can also make people paranoid. It can make, um, you know, delusions and, and, and hallucinations happen. Um, so those are altered states of consciousness as well. Okay, so there's discussion always of drugs. And then there's this little weird one in the middle here, hypnosis. Um, I don't know if you've been to a, to a hypnosis show. Um, when we talk about hypnosis, I may show you a video or two from, from YouTube, you know, in case you haven't been to a show. But the dramatic thing is when you see a hypnotist in action is it looks as though the people on stage have given over their conscious mind 
to the hypnotist. You know, we've talked about the conscious mind is what directs us to do things. Um, and so we decide to do something because it reaches some goal that we have. It feels like in hypnosis that it's the hypnotist that has the goal. They can tell you what, they can say, hey, what you want to do now is cluck like a chicken in front of everybody. And, and you do it. You know, almost like it was your thought or your idea, I'm going to do this. So, so it feels as though conscious, the conscious mind, or at least the operations of the conscious mind, have been given over to the hypnotist. And the hypnotist is now in control of the individual. Um, and of course, that freaks us out a little bit, right? Could, could somebody take control of me and make me do things that, that I might not normally do? Uh, and so that's what makes hypnotism so fascinating. It's one of the things that got me into psychology, I'll be honest. There was a, there was a famous hypnotist, Ravine, who came around New Brunswick where I grew up. And, you know, when I watched a few of those shows, I was like, what the heck is going on here? And I wanted to know, and it kind of got me interested in psychology. So again, it seems like an altered state of consciousness in a different way. So the one, you know, the one theme I guess you'll find here is that when we're talking about consciousness in these situations, it's, 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 it's a really squishy sense of consciousness. It's not that sort of clear thing. It's literally about our sort of subjective states or who's in control of what. Each of these things almost has to be considered individually. Um, and then... And then we can kind of think of how it connects to that greater concept of consciousness or not. Okay, so that's that's what we're going to do. But we're going to I'm mostly going to focus on sleep and dreams. Um, and, and I think I'll probably have a lecture on, on hypnosis. I don't know how much I'll do on, on drugs. I think um, I'll maybe allow you guys to kind of um, dive into that section yourself and, and think about it. But we'll see. Okay, so let's do the sleep. Okay, so the first question of sleep is... Why? You know, it seems like we have 24 hours in a day and we waste a third of it. For a third of that day, we do nothing. And not only do we do nothing, but while we're doing nothing, we're laying there in this completely defensive, to, sorry, defenseless position where, you know, almost anything that could sneak up on us could kill us very easily. You know, we're asleep, we're groggy, we're whatever, our throat is right there. Anything that could attack our throat or whatever, you know, we're just toast. How could we evolve to spend a third of our lives doing nothing and being defenseless? Um, give me an evolution story with this. Well, I sometimes use this to kind of show you that evolutionary stories can sometimes be a little too powerful. Um, you, can, you can sometimes tell an evolutionary story for almost anything, or you can bend things around a little bit. So for example, I've heard two evolutionary stories um, uh, related to the sleep kind of issue. One story goes like this. Um, it says, you know what, our senses, uh, we, we rely primarily on vision. And vision works really well in the daytime. Uh, where we can see things really clearly. And the, the two primary tasks we had back in the day were to, well, the primary task, pretty much, was to find food, but also not to become food ourselves, right? So we want to, we want to be predators, we want to go out and be hunters or gatherers and go out and get food. But while we're doing that, we don't want some other predator to attack us. And so the notion there is, okay, given we rely so much on vision, during the day, we're okay for that. We can see stuff in the distance that we might want to hunt. Um, we can even potentially hunt them at a distance if we have the right tools. Uh, and if something's coming after us, we can see that too. But at night, we, we can't see anything um, or, or we can't see much. And therefore, we're very bad hunters and we're very easy prey. And therefore, it doesn't make sense for us to be active at night. And so the story goes that that's why we have evolved to spend the dark hours um, asleep. Not, uh, you know, we, the idea would be we've, we've learned to find a safe spot, as safe as we can, and sleep for eight hours a day. Um, and the, the primary reason to do that is to not consume energy. That's the notion of why we actually sleep and lay so quietly, because 
energy is where it's at, right? When we're hunting, we're trying to get more energy in our bodies uh, to keep us alive. And if we're going to spend eight hours a day doing nothing, well, we don't want to be active because if we're active, we're going to consume the energy we have, which is going to make us you know, more hungry and need food more. If we can instead be very passive, then we'll consume very little energy um, and and, and, you know, therefore we will be ready the next morning to go out and, and try to get some more food, etc. Um, so by that notion, notice that sleep isn't really important to us other than a way of conserving energy when we're not very useful hunters or, or prey escapers, right? And so that's really by that story, that's the only thing that sleep is doing. But I've also heard people say, okay, hang on. If we could get by sleeping less, imagine some individuals in our group could sleep less. And um, if they were just as functional, if there was no cost to them to sleeping less, okay, maybe there's a little bit of an energy cost if you go on the other thing. If you're awake when other people are asleep, maybe there's a bit of energy cost, but there's also an opportunity for you to potentially do things um, uh, that, that could be valuable um, to, to the group. Uh, and, and so, I mean, this is a, a little bit more of a complicated one, but the argument just sort of goes like this. Sleep must be really important. It must do something really important because if it didn't, why would we do it for eight hours a day? So according to this other view, the fact that we sleep for eight hours a day, roughly, you know, six to six to nine, depending on who you are, hopefully six to nine, five to nine. Um, the reason we do that is because we need to do that. It's important for our system. Something happens during sleep that is really important to our ability to be successful when we're awake. Okay. So one view says sleep is just energy saving mode. The other view says, no, no, there's something really important. That's why we continue to do it. We only hold on to traits that are useful in that sense. Okay. Which one do you believe? Well, you know, based on an evolutionary story, you don't know which one to believe. Um, you can tell both stories. So that's where science comes in. Um, and where does the science of sleep really start? It really starts with the um, discovery, creation of EEG, electrocephalographs. Um, electrocephalograph or elect electrocephalogram, as they, as they have it here, <clears throat> um, really is, you see, you see here this, this um, <laughs> for lack of a better hat, uh, lack of a better uh, example, it's, it's like a swim cap, right? Um, so a cap people put on, but they have all of these things on, which are, which are labeled electrodes. An electrode sounds almost a little scary of some sort, but in reality, what these things really are, are tiny little microphones, okay? They're detecting electrical activity, um, which sort of sounds like static, right? So they're, they're a bunch of little microphones, and we've got them, in this case, all over the person's head in different parts of their head um, and detecting the, the electricity that's going on in that head, listening to the brain. And when you listen to the brain, it creates these, these sorts of things. In fact, could we... Hey, let's. Why not? We have the Internet. Um... I don't know. I'm trying to see if we have a, if we can find a recording. The human brain diversity. Okay. Well, here we have alpha music. We can do that. Mega music. Brain waves. Sound waves. Oh, brain music. Sound of your brain waves. I think that I think what I wanted was back there. I'm not. So I'm not. I'm going to jump back here. And here. Let's see. Can you even hear this when it plays? Okay, this is brain activity converted into music. That's all cool. I want you to actually hear the raw sound. Okay, it's probably not going to be as trivial as I hoped it would be. Um, so I'll just kind of do it for you. Uh, it kind of sounds like this. <laughs> but that that kind of sound um, can be depicted as waveforms. And these waveforms have two characteristics we talk about a lot. Frequency, how, how um, intense they are, versus 
something like that. And, and, um, <laughs> wow, I don't know. And amplitude, which is kind of, which is more like how loud they are. So frequency is how many waves happen per unit time. Amplitude is how big are the waves. Let's just look at some and you get a sense. This was one of the first interesting things they found. <clears throat> When you have somebody sleeping, wearing one of these EEG systems, um, you see that they go through these stages. And they go through this repeatedly, but let's just walk through this a little slowly the first time here. So first of all, when you're awake, awake and alert or awake and relaxed, you see when you're awake and relaxed, you see sort of um, what we're going to call higher amplitude. So that's sort of how big do these things get? Higher amplitude, when you're uh, uh, alert and awake, you see a lower amplitude. Um, but in both cases, you're going to see what we call a high frequency. There's a lot of stuff happening here per unit time compared to, for example, these ones where you start to see the waves stretch out. So we're going to call that lower frequency. And in fact, based on the pattern of waves, we start to name these. So these are called alpha waves, these sort of um, higher amplitude, high frequency waves. Um, these are beta, which are still high frequency, but they're lower amplitude, okay? And so when you lay down in bed, you know, you'll start somewhere up here, right? Probably more relaxed wakefulness, but then you'll start to enter what we call stage one sleep, the early stages of sleep. And what you see right away is um, the frequency starts to um, get lower, right? You start to see these waves spread apart. Um, you also will every now and then see these so-called theta waves, which are sort of high amplitude, low frequency waves uh, of this sort. Um, and so they'll be mixed with it. So you're just basically, what you're seeing here is the brain relaxing a little bit. And it's kind of like the static goes from shh when you're awake to more like a shh. I don't know how to do, I, I, I have no idea how to do frequency. Yeah, oh, yeah, that would be frequency. So frequency would be frequency. So you'd actually hear up here, it would be like a higher sound. Here it would be more, it would get lower. Um, that's That would be the reflection of the frequency. The point is the brain's starting to relax and you can see it, okay, in the brain waves. This continues to stage two, which is a lot like stage one, except we start to see these little things happen. These what are called sleep spindles, a little high frequency, weird little thing here, or these so-called K complexes where you get this little um, upshooting of the wave and then a big drop. And, and then back to the normal pattern, okay? And these are the kind of indicators that we're moving from a sort of light sleep into a much deeper sleep, okay? And we move through stage two. So stage two, we start to see these things kind of come up. And then we hit what we call slow wave sleep. And these are the big delta waves, high amplitude, low frequency. This is your brain chilled out, okay? And so it's a very non-intense, um, sound coming from the brain. And that's, that's the brain in its deepest sleep. Okay. Um, it does that for a while and then it goes into REM sleep and REM sleep is where dreams happen. It's called REM because it stands for rapid eye movement. That's what you actually see. So if you watch someone sleep, you'll every now and then see their eyes moving underneath their eyelids. When you see that happening, they are dreaming. If you wake them up at that moment, they should be able to tell you what they were just dreaming about. Okay, you, you will wake them up from a dream and they'll be able to tell you about that dream. Now, the kind of interesting thing about REM sleep is the pattern looks quite a bit like awake and alert. It's not as high frequency but it's pretty darn close and it has these same sort of beta waves. It also has some of these theta waves, which we were seeing just as we were sort of falling asleep. So it's kind of a mix of these two, but to some extent, it's kind of like the brain when the brain is awake and alert. Um, so the brain kind of wakes up from deep sleep, but we don't wake up. Instead, we enter this dream kind of state. Okay. Kind of cool. So thanks to this device, we're able to kind of watch the brain move from stage to stage as the person sleeps. Now, let's just get the rest of the story here. 
these cycles happen repeatedly through the night. So this is an example of what might happen where someone's uh, originally awake and then they go down to stage one sleep and that this is sort of how much time they're spending in it. So let's, you know, they lay down, they spend a bunch of time awake, but then they go down to stage one, which they stay up for a little while, down to stage two, which they stay up for a little while, and then they go down into deep sleep. From deep sleep, they may go back here. It shows them spending a little bit of time in stage two again. Maybe you do that, or maybe you go all the way to, to, to the dream. But at any rate, you will go from deep to a dream state, and you'll have that dream for a while. Cool. And so that's sort of what's happened after an hour and a half of your sleep. You've kind of gone through those stages to the dream, and then you do it again. Okay. At the end of the dream, you sink back down stage two, back to deep sleep, um, and then you might come back up, spend some time in deep in stage two, and, and be at a dream for a while. This what this is what this is suggesting is that um, you might even wake up from the dream in the middle of the night. You know, maybe this is a bathroom break or something. You wake up, you go back to sleep, back to stage one, stage two, deep sleep. So the things to notice, and you know, back to dream, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the things to notice is that the deep sleep seems to get priority early on. Early in the night, we spend a lot of time in deep sleep. But every time we go through the cycle, it's like less and less deep sleep. And after so many hours, we've had, we've seemingly had all the deep sleep we need. Need? What the heck is it doing? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, notice sort of opposite that is the dream state. So early in the night, we don't tend to dream that long. We go back to the deep sleep. But as these cycles continue, the time we spend in a dream state um, gets longer and longer. And that's why, by the way, if you ever sleep in on the weekend, you probably wake up remembering all these dreams because, you know, once you've got all the sleep your body needs, then you spend a lot of time in dreaming, in a dreaming state. Uh, and so you get more of that as the night progresses. Okay. So again, thanks to the EEG system, we're now able to kind of see exactly what you're seeing here. You know, how the brain is um, is changing over the course of the night. Uh, there are apps now, by the way, that can measure this for you. Um, I have one with this phone, this, this um, I forget what this is called, a Fitbit Sense, something like that. I got it specifically because I'm doing some research on sleep right now and I wanted to see these cycles and it, it isn't working for me. It's not, so, so I don't know how good the technology is. But there is technology. I was hoping to show you, you know, how much deep sleep am I getting, etc. but... I don't have good data to show you, I'm afraid. Um, cool. Okay. So what has this told us about sleep? Well, not a whole lot. It's really created more questions than answers, right? I mean, we have a sense of, the, of a process that's now happening with sleep, but now we can ask something like, well, what's going on in deep sleep? You know, and why do we need a lot of it early and then less? And what's going on in these dream states? These, these seem to be the important states. The rest seem to be sort of transitions uh, from one to the other. Why are they important? What do they do? Okay, how do you study that? Again, psychology is challenging. How are you going to get an understanding of what these stages of sleep do? Let's tell you about some studies and people kind of looking at various theories and, and, and testing them. One theory was that, okay, maybe when we sleep, that's when our body physically repairs itself. Um, and so maybe sleep is critical for undoing all the damage we do to our bodies during the day. Seems reasonable, right? Maybe it's, it's some sort of physical repair thing. Um, well, there, there's a few sort of thoughts on this. So the first one I'm going to tell you relates to this picture. And this is a, a cool way to do a study. It shows, again, how clever some, psych some psychologists are. And so in this study, what they did is they, they went to marathon locations. Why marathon locations? Because people come from all over the world to run a marathon. And that means you have a whole whack of different jet lags, right? Because some of these people have traveled a long way from different time zones to be in one place, and they often have issues with their sleep because of that. And so you can do, for everybody who races, you can start by asking, what's your personal best time? And then you could say, how's your sleep been the last couple of days? 
you know, if, you know, first of all, how long have you even been in this time zone? Um, did you just arrive yesterday? Um, did you arrive a week ago so you could adjust, etc.? But then you could sort of ask, you know, how good's your sleep been the last couple of days? And then you let them run the race and you see how well they do. And you can ask, you know, very simple questions. Do people who got very poor sleep, um, do they do worse? Because marathons are physically grueling, right? And if somebody wasn't getting enough sleep and therefore wasn't getting the physical repair, we would expect them to do worse in the marathon. What we find is not. <laughs> That's a weird way to say it. What I mean by that is the amount of sleep a runner had or did not have before the marathon does not seem to predict their performance at all. Uh, even those people who didn't sleep hardly at all and, and feel tired once they start running, they seem to do just as well as, as they would normally do. Okay. And so what we've learned from this a little bit, people have looked at lack of sleep and how it affects different performance on different sports. And what they found is as long as the task that's being done is relatively simple, your running is fairly simple. Yes, you sometimes have a strategy. You're deciding when you're going to speed up and when you're going to slow down. And, and sometimes that depends on the people running with you. But mostly it's about just doing your thing, getting into your headspace and doing the thing that you've practiced over and over and over again. So, it's a, so it is a real habitual task that you've done. And when tasks are habitual, then they don't seem to be bothered too much by sleep. But if the task requires deep conscious thought, um, if it's more like playing chess or something where strategy is really important, where you have to be able to keep in mind, you know, a bunch of things and, and on, on the fly decide what strategy to use and how best to use it, in those situations, now a lack of sleep is a problem. If you don't get sleep, you can't do that sort of conscious thought as well as you could but you can do the habitual tasks, okay? So you, again, you know, that, that distinction that, that I talk about always between the frontal lobes and the limbic system, it's kind of like, hey, if you're relying on the limbic system, it can do its thing without much sleep. But if you're relying on the frontal lobes, you're gonna need some sleep uh, or else you're gonna see an impact, okay? So, so it doesn't seem to affect physical repair, but it is doing something. It is doing something more cognitive. What is going on? Well, let me tell you about some other kind of neat studies. You can, um, you can disrupt sleep uh, in various ways, and, and people have done this in various ways. Um, so where do we start? So let me talk about consolidation. This consolidation thing is right here, and I'll mention that. Um, they've done studies of the following sort. The, these were, and I'm going to get into the more specific studies I'm alluding to here, but let me start with a general study. They did a general study. Um, well, no, it actually fits with this one, with the sleep of, of, of learning information and deep sleep. So they asked people to learn some stuff, just like you were studying for an exam right? Gave you a bunch of stuff to learn. Um, so a bunch of information, you went through and learned it. And then they did the following. So for, for one group of people, they allowed them to sleep at night, perfectly fine. Um, and for another group of people, they did not. Uh, they kept them awake uh, over the, the course of the evening. Um, and then in the morning, they gave them a test for the information they had learned the night before. And what they found was that the people who um, did not sleep did not do as well on the test. Um, something was lost. Sleep was somehow, even though people weren't studying while they were asleep, right? So they had equal amount of time studying the information, but those people that slept seemed to remember it better. And, and we now know um, that one of the things that's happening with deep sleep is something we call consolidation, the consolidation of information that you've learned through the day. It's like the information you've come in touch with, somehow the brain is sort of reorganizing that information. That's what we call consolidation. Something important happens during the deep sleep cycles that seem to um, take what we've learned during the day and store it in a way that makes it more accessible to us so that when we're writing the test the next day, that information is more available. So we kind of know that's what, what deep sleep does. 
um, or at least that's part of what deep sleep does. So it's important for our ability to learn. Um, and of course, learning is how we get better and better at functioning in the world. Um, what about the REM sleep? What about dreams? Well, first of all, I want to give you a, a sense of how you study that because it's kind of it's kind of cool. You can go back to this and imagine somebody was sleeping and you had an EEG system on them. So you could sort of track what stage they're in. And you don't even need an EEG. You could just look at their eyes if you were very patient. But when they get to REM sleep, uh, when they get to REM sleep, we wake them up. Hey, wake up, wake up. Why, why, why are you waking me up? Well, because you were dreaming. I was just starting to dream. Okay, cool. Yeah, go back to sleep. <laughs> okay. Um, and so they go back to sleep. Now, if you wake them up at the beginning of a REM period, when they go back to sleep, they'll drop back down to deep. And they won't have that REM period. And then they come up and they're about to do another REM one, but you say, wake up, wake up, wake up. And so every time they're about to dream, you wake them up. And then you let them go back to sleep. What you can do with this is you can give them a full night's sleep. They can get eight hours sleep but no dreaming. You can deprive them of dreaming. So it's like you can remove the dream part from sleep. And you can ask, okay, people who are allowed to dream, what advantage do they show compared to the people that aren't? And what we see is, is in, in experiments, they've shown that it's the learning of skills. So um, we call this procedural memory. You know, let's say you're learning a new sport or a new musical instrument or dance moves. You're doing various dance moves, you know, the kind of things that involve your body and learning how to move your body or use your body in certain ways to produce a certain effect. Um, If somebody is practicing some skill, so let's just pick something like learning guitar, let's say, and we have them over a number of days and we're teaching them guitar stuff, but where you know one group is allowed to dream and the other group is not allowed to dream. Both are allowed to sleep, but one is not allowed to dream. What we would see is the group that is not allowed to dream it cannot pick up the skills so well. They can still pick up information, by the way. As long as they're getting the deep sleep, they'll pick up information perfectly fine. But the actual skill of, of whatever they're doing, you know, let's say it was a dance. Let's say they're learning some hip hop style of dance or whatever. And every day we're, we're kind of looking at them. What we would see is the people that dream get better faster. They can actually do the skill, show the skill faster. So there's something in our dreams. And if any of you, you know, here, here's an example. I, had. I actually worked for a while in a Wendy's flipping burgers, blah, blah, blah. And when I'd go to sleep at night, I'd be flipping burgers in my dreams. It's kind of like the actions I perform during the day would be actions that would get into my dream state. And it's almost like there's some other kind of practice or something else going on in those dreams that is making the skill learning better. Cool. That's what we know um, at this time from the studies we've done and a little bit about how we know that. Okay, where do I go from here? Is this it? Okay, sleep disorders, ah, cool. This is another big, big issue. Um, so we know a little bit about normal sleep cycles. We know a little bit about the importance of deep sleep and dreams <clears throat> and how they come into things. Another major area in psychology is you know, people who can't sleep. Um, and in fact, we know that insomnia, the, the inability to sleep is, is really a problem. Uh, people who have insomnia have a lot of cognitive impairments. Remember I told you your conscious, your ability to think consciously is not very good when you're um, sleep deprived, right? So you can't think through things, but they also show a lot of health risks. And as suggested, it's often associated with worry, guilt, or stress. They're spending the night, things are going through their head and they just want to get to sleep, but they can't stop worrying about whatever, whatever. Um, it can lead to addiction to sleep medications. It can also lead to other extreme things. You know, what, one of the reasons I, I think so many bands become addicted to some of the drugs they do is because they're continually moving through time zones and they're continually being asked to perform from, say, 8 p.m. until you know, 11 p.m. on stage. Um, and then, uh, well, then everything packs up and moves and, and they go to another time zone and they got to be ready to, to perform at, at the same time locally, but it's a different time for them. So they have limited pockets of, of time when they can sleep. And often when they have the opportunity to sleep, it's not when their body wants to sleep because of the jet lag. And so they have trouble sleeping and they often self-medicate. Uh, the most extreme case of this was Michael Jackson, who literally had a doctor 
anesthetize him um, so he could sleep because he wanted to be the best for his shows. And the doctor um, overdid it and, and essentially killed Michael Jackson in his sleep. Um, you know, this is how these sorts of things happen. Uh, so there's a lot of work on that and how to reduce it. Uh, I might show you a little something uh, at some point about the sleep study I've been playing with, and I, I think you'll find it cool. Um, I just got to figure out if I can do it all on this computer so you can see it. Okay, so that's just an area, and the textbook will talk about that. The other thing I, I want you aware of for sleep, and this is kind of a, a cool but freaky area, is there are these what are called parasomnias, and, and you know of one of them well. It's called sleepwalking. Um, there's times when people do things while they are still asleep that we normally think people should only do when they're awake. You know, and that includes walking around. But it turns out sleepwalking is just one of the things people do. Sleep eating is very common. Apparently, some people wake up in the middle of the night and while still asleep, hit the kitchen, start eating stuff, and they wake up in the morning and they see the leftovers of, you know, what they've done. There's also something called sexomnia. Check that out online. Um, people who have sex while they're asleep. And, and there's, a, there's a weird story that always comes to mind in one of these that just strikes me as kind of funny in some sense, where there's a woman who's, who's um, there's a couple, and the woman member of the couple um, apparently at one point says to the male, um, you know, sometimes when we're intimate, you know, most of the time you're very gentle and calm and all that stuff. But, but every now, now and then, especially when it happens in the middle of the night, you're much more aggressive and animalistic or whatever. And, and, and I kind of like that. Um, everybody likes different stuff or whatever. Let's not judge. Um, but the, the important part is the male was like, what? What do you mean in the middle of the night? What do you mean? I'm, I'm not an aggressor. I, I don't do that. So what was going on is, you know, when the male was being sensitive and, and whatever, that's when he was awake having sex. But every now and then he would have sex still in his sleep and it, it would it would be very different in, in, in those sort of situations. So, wow. Now, there's also very scary um, things that happen here. People have killed other individuals and claimed that, yeah, I kind of dreamed about doing that a little bit, but I didn't think I, I, I didn't do it. I didn't. So they actually, you know, don't just sleepwalk, but they sleep kill or they sleep sexually abuse, etc. cetera. Um, and there are ways. So you'd think, oh, isn't this just an excuse? How can you ever, if, if you go searching online, you'll find cases in Toronto of, of sexomnia and sexual abuse where people have um, not been found guilty because they can look at the brain waves of people as they sleep and they can detect patterns in the brain waves that are associated with these parasomnias. And so they can kind of say, you know what, this person might be the kind of person that would do this kind of thing without really understanding what they're doing because they're asleep. So, you know, do you believe that or not? Check out the things online, but, it, but it's interesting reading. This is all linked to something I haven't told you about um, that much, but it's very cool. Just before we dream, our body releases neurotransmitters that paralyze our body. And that's good. Um, that means we don't act out our dreams. And, and usually that's very good. You don't want to be in bed with someone who's acting out their dreams because often they would be flailing and kicking and doing all sorts of stuff and you'd get beat up. Um, but the brain, again, paralyzes the body. So our mind, you know, imagines our body doing all these things, but our body is, is sort of paralyzed. And in fact, sometimes we feel that in our dreams. We feel like we're really slow. We can barely move or we have a weight on our chest or something like that. We can sort of feel the paralysis of our body and it can kind of sneak into our dreams sometimes. There are also times when people wake up and that paralysis is still there for a little bit. So they'll wake up and they'll be like, oh my God, my body is paralyzed. And, and the paralysis will ease, but it freaks people out sometimes, you know, when that happens. So again, this makes sense though. It's to stop people acting out their dreams. And when we have these parasomnias, sometimes it's because that's not working quite right. And so people are essentially acting out their dreams um, uh, a little bit. Fascinating stuff. Check it out. Uh, it'll, it'll make you go, whoa. Okay. I think that's it. No, that's not it. 
pet, <laughs> okay, pet owners. That's kind of weird that I throw this in there. Um, I should know what I've thrown in there, but this was an old slide I grabbed. So anyway, yeah, um, all, all about, you know, various things that are related to sleep, stress, pet ownership, et cetera. Exercise is, is very good. So all this to say, you know, you can do things that will positively impact your sleep. And if you do that, it's going to positively impact a whole bunch of other things. When we are sleep deprived, we are not at our best. Um, our conscious mind is not at our best. And we use our conscious mind, you know, to often guide the important decisions in our life. So taking some time to uh, configure a life where you can get better sleep uh, is, is a smart thing to do. Maybe, you know, check out online some of these uh, sites of how to, how to improve my sleep. I'm not going to go through the details of this. I think we've been talking for a while. That's all right there ah, why am I going into biorhythms <laughs> okay um, okay I do know what I'm what I'm what I want to um, highlight here and and what I want to highlight here is just one tip about sleeping better which is the following our bodies go through natural cycles of releasing hormones at various times so for example let's just look at melatonin here Around 9 p.m. at night, this is an average person. Our body starts releasing me uh, melatonin, uh, starts secreting this. And this helps start to relax our body and relax our mind and gets us ready, you know, when we do go to sleep, to go down to, to, to sleep. Now, if you lead a regular life, if you wake up at about the same time, let's say 6 a.m., and you go to bed at about the same time, let's say 10 p.m., then all of this gets really synchronized nicely. The, the thing that makes you sleepy is released just before you go to bed. The thing that starts getting you awake, cortisol starts to get released when you wake up, uh, and then in, insulin also, which is sort of going to sort of help wake you up. And so as long as you consistently go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time, your brain and your life is synchronized well with your body and the changes in your body. But if you change when you go to bed and when you wake up if you have a lot of variability in your sleep cycles then you're going to get off kilter from your body it will kind of be like you are jet lagged all the time and you will have a lot of trouble going to sleep because your body doesn't know when you're going to sleep and it doesn't know when you're going to wake up unless you have a habitual way of doing it your body just can't predict you know, what you're going to want, what state you're going to want it to be in at any given time. So the single best thing you can do to sleep well is to try to have a structured schedule that includes getting up at roughly the same time, at least five days a week, and going to bed at roughly the same time. If you do that, your conscious mind will be much stronger and you'll be much more prepared to kind of take on the challenges of the day. Okay. Cool. Excellent. That was good for sleep. So I'm going to leave sleep there. Um, we are going to talk a little bit more about dreams, though, and how to study them. That'll be coming up. Okay.